looks like Foxy. I think Charles came to play tonight. Dominique does not disappoint. What a play by T-Man. Jimmy Smith hitting for three. Again. Big time plays here by Steve Smith. It's another fun-filled episode of Open Court here on NBA TV. I'm Ernie Johnson. Got this great panel here. That uh, and, and this is a very, all I'm going to say, it's a very special installment of Open Court. And you'll find out uh, in just a moment. Anyway, uh, Charles Barkley is here. Uh, <laughs> he's, of course, the 11-time All-Star. And uh, uh, always, always great to see you. Steve Kerr also. Great three-point shooters of all time. In fact, the leading percentage-wise three-point shooter in the history of the NBA. Steve Smith, uh, the Michigan State Spartan, the guy who was once traded for Isaiah Ryder, uh, is uh, also with us. <laughs> so, so is Kenny the Jet yeah, Smith, who was once traded for a lot of guys. Uh, <laughs> Dominic, That's right, took a lot. Talking about guys. Dominic Wilkins <laughs> was, uh, is here as well, the human highlight film. Um, Oh, man. What else do you have to say besides that? He's a Hall of Famer. Tracy McGrady, the recently retired Tracy McGrady. What, what? He's coming back. He's uh, coming back. Shoot. You've left the door open to playing overseas, though, correct? Yeah, but I don't think I am. Okay, so that door's closed. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Rick Fox, and Rick Fox uh, also joins us. Uh, you've seen Rick uh, all over the place, and like, like Kenny, a, a North Carolina Tar Heel, and uh, was once a guest judge on RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this show, this show was actually <laughs> Joe's face. He was, he was. a guest judge. And, and so for him, this, is, this show is actually... All television ain't good television. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I just saw Rick on the show recently. Well, I thought you said you yeah. were going to say you just saw RuPaul. <laughs> oh, that was Chico. Oh, my bad. For Rick, for Rick <laughs> appearing on this show is actually a step down from that. So, uh, but we, we appreciate you. We appreciate you being here. So here's why this show is so special. It's fan driven uh, because we got a bunch of a bunch of questions that were tweeted to us. Oh my God! That fans, viewers would like to hear you guys address these, and so I'm just going to like pull some out at random, okay? And and I'll kind of let you guys drive it. And when you've when you've uh, answered a question in your mind sufficiently, or nobody else wants to talk about it, say, hey, next question, okay? Do we, do we uh, understand this? Got it. Right, we got you. Ernie. Okay. Next question. Have I told you that Rick was once a guest judge on? <laughs> And may the best <laughs> woman. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Is that what um, they said? Oh, yeah. May the best woman win. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, and my away God. we go. Oh, boy, um, it's not worth it, man. It might have turned down that part. Well, listen to this question. Uh, who's a coach you're glad you never played for? Oh. That's who's a coach me, me you're go. glad you never played for? Bobby Knight. You couldn't have done that? Nah, man. I saw that letter. I didn't even open it. Oh, come on. I, didn't yeah. even, I did not even open it. Indiana like, recruited you. No, Indiana. they didn't recruit me. I, I don't know if he recruited me, but they sent me a letter. And I how, do you like, know what, how do you know what the letter said? He didn't open it. <laughs> I didn't open it. Like, <laughs> Maybe it said we're not recruiting. <laughs> you know, that's that Dear much Kenny. time. That's good. Dear Kenny, not a chance. <laughs> not that one, Why do you want to play for Bobby Knight? I, I'm, I, because I think that you could get me motivated other by screaming, yelling, and kicking at me. But Coach uh, Smith used to scream, yo. No, he, yeah, Coach yeah. Smith did not scream yeah. and yell. Yeah. Okay, maybe and, no, not, and never maybe used profanity. You, you and wait, and he never golden. used profanity. <laughs> oh, he was the golden. Have you ever golden. heard him use profanity? Ever? No, 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 never. But he would. He, he might. I, sometimes he I wish he just did. But if he raised yeah. his voice, you were like nervous. <laughs> Ernie, right? I want what? to hear Charles's version of Bobby Knight because he tried out for the Olympics. And you know, it wasn't as bad as people think it was because like they invited like 120 people, and I made it down to the final 16. <laughs> But it, it, was, it was like a trial camp, so he really didn't spend a lot of individual time. I don't think I've ever played for, seen a coach that I couldn't play for, because I think you have to adapt. And the thing about Bobby Knight, uh, I always respect him because he graduated players. I didn't say couldn't. I said wouldn't. Yeah. But <laughs> yelling and screaming don't bother me. Uh, you know, I'm one of those guys. I'm a yell out of screamer. Exactly, because you're a yeller and a screamer. Yeah, but, but I'm saying if, if somebody yells and screams at me, it makes me play better. You know, I was fortunate to play with Rick Mahorn and Derek Smith. And when they yell, the hardest thing about me when I became the leader of a team, well, I used to yell at guys and they started crying. And I had to learn who I could yell at and not yell at. That was the hardest thing for me to learn. Because me, Mahorn, and, uh, and uh, Derek Smith would yell at each other all the time and we started playing better. But some guys, you can't yell at them. But it wouldn't have bothered me really? if a coach yelled and okay. cursed me. 
Uh, give me, give me some more. Anybody else going to be forthcoming? You know, you would great not coach. Wouldn't have had. It. I didn't have the chance to him in Boston when he came in. Uh huh. Uh, basically got rid of everybody on that team. Uh, but uh, to me, I don't think his style fit in the pros. Mm. Oh, mm. that was deep. Yeah, well, Rick uh, Pitino. For I me, was going for to play me, for Rick. It was, he was going to play for Rick? For me, it was, it was Chris Ford. You would not want to play for Chris Ever Ford. again. Oh, ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were both on, those, we were both on that team. Play for Man. We were both on that team. I played for some tough, he, I played for some wanna, tough coaches. You might want to re-answer your question. Oh, yeah, that's the way we're phrasing uh, it. Hey, yeah. I played for some tough coaches, right? <laughs> but I don't know what you call Chris Ford. Yeah, I, I mean, some of the stuff that he would say to players, it wasn't even basketball cursing out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he just said stuff almost like about your family. You know, like that. So it, was, it was tough, man. And it was, it was many times that he and I, and Rick can tell you, yeah. I wanted to choke him a couple of times. Yep. I mean, that's how bad it got. I left and, a couple but, of you know, and, and, and as bad as it got, I remember him telling me mm. right before we went in the playoff, and he had one of the assistant coaches come over and tell him, he said, tell Nick that he got to get this team ready for the playoffs. We, we're counting on him. Now, he hadn't played me for like 15 games. He would pay me two or three minutes and take me out. That was his way of paying me back. And then he says, you got to get the team ready to play. And I said to him, I won't tell you exactly what I said to him. <laughs> but I told him, you know, all due respect, mm, you. Mm -hmm. I'll play hard because I'm a player. I'm a competitor. I'm gonna do whatever I can do to win. I said, don't ever say anything to me the rest of the year. <laughs> Won't I you say what you, you said? We can I put it on you. I said, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Forget you. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what I said. Yeah. But man, that's the worst guy I've ever played for. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna call a. I'm gonna call a move on uh, yeah. <laughs> from that question. This boy, man, sweating over there, man. <laughs> <laughs> he looked look like he was about to choke up. Chris, yeah, I was ready to choke up. Chris Ford, look at that. Chris Ford, Chris Ford, Bob Knight texting right now. Uh, uh, watching open court, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, which player from your era would you have wanted to be teammates with? Magic. Charles Barkley. Oh, mine is easy, man. Shaq. Kim Olajuwon. Larry Bird. Magic. Mm -hmm. Never had a really great point guard. Yeah. Man. You play with Kenny? <laughs> <laughs> he was older. Oh, you, know, he, you know, he was ready to retire. right there. You told me you got hey, but I'm going to tell you, but I got to tell you about Kenny. <laughs> the story I was telling you about. Uh -huh. you no, know, because Kenny came and he was this happy kid, you know, just got bouncing you around. And I kept wanting to say, he looks like something I'm trying to put my finger on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, I got it. Easter Bunny. <laughs> and that was his nickname. Was a whole Easter. year. A whole year his name was Bunny. Easter. And then it became Easter it was Easter or Bunny. <laughs> Easter. They say, oh, you just hopping around, I, hopping around. I thought I would be happy going to a team with Moses hey, Malone and Dominique. I'm thinking you were you in heaven. I I said, that's what I thought. Hey, I realized cool. I was in purgatory until I got to Easter with a oh, King Malone. We've been here together for, four, for <laughs> what, 16 years now. But 16, 16 years, years, every time I see him in the Hawks, the, uh, arena, anywhere else. Easter! What up, Easter? <laughs> Charles, 14 years. Have you heard that? Easter. No. Easter. No. Nope. Easter Bunny. <laughs> yeah. But I I'm not it. sure that's a compliment. We were coming down on a break. Like Easter Bunny. <laughs> we would come down on a break. I said, Easter. He <laughs> 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 the other side of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it was, I mean, yeah, that was, that was funny. You know, Ernie, oh, the, 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 I'm going to pick three guys. Okay. You pick one. I know that. But these, these are my three favorite point guards ever. John Stockton, Gary Payton, and Jason Kidd. I would have loved to play with a, a, a supreme point guard like that. Who was, especially, you know, guys who... So you didn't think Kevin Johnson was a supreme point guard? He was a supreme point guard as far as scoring. Mm. You know, but I'm talking about I've never played... Like, Carl Malone was a great player. But well, he probably got 20,000 points just for oh, passes from Judd Stockton. <laughs> you know, I never played with a guy who was looking for me first. Remember, Maurice Chief couldn't see out one eye. He, had to, he could only pass the ball to the one eye Doc was in. You know, so it was hard for me. So I was just running the court for the heck of it. You know, but uh, and, and Jason Kidd to me was just extraordinary. You know, a guy obviously a walking triple double. But Garrett Payton. I never played against a guy who was uh, who was just so tenacious, you know, on offense and defense. I mean, he played with a chip on his shoulder. And uh, but those are my three guys I would love to play with. 
next. Right. No, thank you very much. Uh, was there a point in basketball you thought about quitting? Absolutely, for me it was. <laughs> jump in there. Hey, <laughs> really, hey, you want to tell us? Absolutely. No, absolutely. No, my last year in Orlando, mm -hmm. which it was my fourth year there, and I went to Orlando because I, was, I thought I was going to be playing alongside Grant Hill, but obviously he had his, his ankle injury. So for, for two years, it was great, you know, carrying the team, all-star games, the man. Third year, that was probably one of my, my best year of my career where I averaged 32 points. And, um, you know, first round and out. We got to my fourth year, I was already pissed because they traded Daryl Armstrong away. They traded Mike Miller away. So I'm left with a few rookies on my team. Drew Good, Gordon Giracek, you know, Deshaun Stevenson. And um, I'm frustrated at this time, you know. You're frustrated right now, just telling the story. <laughs> you have no idea how I felt this year. We only won 19 games that year. And, you know, by that time, I was looking to compete, you know, in the East, at least to get out of the first round. Never happened. I'm frustrated. Teams are playing. This is when they ingraded uh, zone. So teams are playing zone on me. I started off the season slow, averaging about 22 points. Mm, slow. <laughs> that's yeah, that's and now, I'm coming off of averaging 32. Yeah, know, I'm coming crazy. off of averaging 32. Sounds easy. Started off, they're zoning me. I'm frustrated. I, I even think I called Tyrone Lou to, to, to get MJ on the phone. Like, man, how do I beat this? Like, I, I needed some help because I was really frustrated. And it got to the point where I was like, man, I don't even want to go to the arena today because we were getting our ass whooped. I could have 30. But we still lose. It Next was like question, Ernie. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's coming that way. Uh, yeah. like, give him two values right uh, quick. Uh, well, he uh, animated it. That's the beauty. Oh she still won the scoring title again that year, though. I still won the scoring title. Still won the scoring title. Won the scoring title. Won the scoring yeah. title. Yeah. Take a deep uh, breath, team. Yeah, yeah, hot, right, man. Bro, I was frustrated. We see, man. We see you. Anybody else come close to quitting? I actually. For me, it was in Orlando as well. Oh. <laughs> was it, uh, following no, a pattern Chris made here. me want to choke him. It was, I didn't want to quit. But it was in Orlando at the end of my career. as I was leading the league in points per minute as a starter, even playing 18 points a game as a starter. I remember Chuck Daly blesses, so I love Chuck Daly. And he came to me and said, Nick, you know, we think we're going to start Matt Harvin because we need more scoring. I'm like, huh? I said, Chuck, I'm leading the league in points per minute. You need more scoring. I said, Chuck, you know, I've been in the league a long time. And so I can, I can I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big man. I'm a big boy. So you can tell me, if you want to start this kid, it's okay. I have no problem, but don't insult my intelligence. It was that moment I said, you know what? It's time to quit. It's time well, to it was in Orlando for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it was, at that point, the game started to change a little bit. It was more about pacifying and taking care of these young kids more than winning. And I didn't want any part of that. Anybody else want to weigh in? No, I think it was me. Shaking, of the, yeah. shaking of the head. As we go to break, I'll just give you, a, I'll give you a, an idea of what's coming up next uh, because you may have to think about this. It's a little bit of an involved question. The NBA is missing blank, and the NBA is getting better at blank. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Deep thoughts. <laughs> we'll be back. When I grew up, it was important to have a Nick jersey more than a Clyde Fraser jersey. And now I think it's more important to have the player instead of the team. Back here on Open Court, where the fans have taken over with their questions on Twitter. Um, and I told you what the question is as we went to break. And now, Steve, I hope you've been pondering this one. Uh, the NBA is missing blank, and the NBA is getting better at blank. Uh, the NBA is missing low post man. I mean, that is so different from when we all, other than Tracy, when everybody else kind of came into the league. The NBA was dominated by big men, and now there's, there's hardly any of them. And um, I think that's bad for the game. Too many, too many teams just launching threes from everywhere. Uh, they're getting better. What are they getting better at? I'm going to let somebody else in. <laughs> <laughs> well thought out first part of the answer. What is the NBA getting better at, Charles? Well, first of all, can I do the missing part? Sure. I think that the NBA don't have a, a veteran liaison mm -hmm. on the team. 
Yeah. You know, when I came into the NBA, we had five guys who were 35 years old. They taught me how to save my money. You know, because 70% of professional athletes go broke, Ernie. You know, Doc and Moses and Maurice Cheeks and Andrew Tony, they taught me how to save my money. They taught me how to dress. They told me I couldn't dress like a bum. They made me wear suits. You know, because I'm going back to the day we used to travel in warm-up suits. I do agree with the, the way the Yankees travel. You always travel in a suit. I, I love when David Stern came in with the dress code. I thought that was really good because it was really good for young black men because if you're making $20 million a year, you can dress like a bum. But what was happening, we got so many young black kids who were dressing like, quote, unquote, the, those young kids we had in the NBA, but they can't get jobs dressing like that. You can't go to Microsoft, IBM, CNN, TNT, dress like that and get a job. That's unrealistic. I thought a lot of those older guys I played with were magnificent. Like I say, teachers, not just about the game of basketball, about life. The, 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 now, what was the second part of that question? Well, I, want some, I would love to have you know, we had time, in, time, in, in, in the, the course right of that, time, Kenny, I appreciate it. In the course of that, I forgot what the first part of the question was. Oh, Next oh, question. What, what is the NBA getting better at? Is there something the NBA is getting better at? At. Marketing, yes. marketing, Kenny. You were told totally yes. Marketing, yes. they're no. getting better at. I think what, and then what to me, what they're missing is uh, team play. Yeah. I think that you know, when I grew up, it was important to have a Nick jersey more than a Clyde Fraser jersey, and now I think it's more important to have the player instead of the team. So you grew up with teams, and um, I don't think you grow up with teams anymore. Uh, and I want to say this one thing about David Stern. The one thing he did going out the door was I think they have really made a conscious effort to make it more of a level playing field. You know, they, they, they made it where if these teams sign these players, there are serious penalties, serious uh, salary cap, cap ramifications because Steve played in San Antonio. Steve Smith played in San Antonio. Tracy played in Orlando. Kenny played in Houston. You know, Dominique played in Atlanta. We need competitive balance across the board. We need a guy like a Reggie Miller who can go to Indiana, be a Hall of Fame player, and have a competitive team. I don't want us to be like baseball. We have 10 teams that's got a legitimate chance and the other 20 stink. And I think David Stern did a fantastic job with his last collective bargaining agreement to try to level the playing field. Anybody on this side of the room want to? Jump on either part of that question. Yeah, I, I think as far as what the game has, um, what the game is missing, is definitely missing is the post game is gone in the NBA. Back when we came up through the league, the game was played from the inside out. Like I said earlier, that it was a shooter's dream to have a guy post up to get double teams where you can kick out, where you can get clean open shots. Now it's hard in today's game for guys to get really clean open shots on a consistent basis, and I think the league need to get back to more of that, but it comes with teaching too. But because I think with the AU basketball and there's so many games played, it's hard to teach kids the fundamentals of the game. And I think that's a big part that's missing. In I think to piggyback off Charles Monique, just to add, I think us as former players, the league and everybody involved is not doing a, a, a good enough job of preparing guys for the end, you know, after basketball. You know, I think we talk so much, you know, and I, you know, I, I would say myself as well, talking about guys, what you need to do to stay in the league. But I think we need to take it a step further and talk about what's coming next after retirement. You know, I think a lot of us don't want to talk about that, but I think um, a lot of these young guys need to hear after you play 14, 15, 16 years, there's still another world that you still can be successful. Right, because you can't play this game forever. You know, and I often tell young kids, it's what you do today that dictates who you become in the future. You got to be willing to step outside of that sports world and start to build the relationships. So once you step out of the game, that you know exactly what you want to do, what type of field <clears> you want to go to after basketball. I know for me, I prepared myself probably four or five years before I retired. So I knew what I wanted to do once I retired. but. I think a lot of kids now, because they make so much money, that they don't look that far ahead. They can't and, see it. And they can't see they it, can't, so they, they get themselves it. in trouble. It's hard to believe that a guy who makes $100, $150 million over the course of his career, then one year out of basketball, you have nothing. That's unbelievable to me. But again, it's the lack of education, really preparing yourself. You live for the moment instead of for the future. I think the NBA can uh, generate some more patience. 
uh, especially in the coaching uh, capacity, uh, long you know stability in the coaching ranks. I uh, understand the need to win and to need and the need to win as soon as possible, but I think that comes with growth and uh, and then I think I got to give the young players today credit for their their approach to the history of the game. I think we have a wiser, more respectful group of uh, uh, young players that actually pay homage to those that have come before them. Yeah, I think what's missing, uh, to piggyback on what Charles said, is the veteran leadership. When I came into the league, I had Charles Oakley, uh, Kevin Willis, Antonio Davis, Muggsy Bogues, uh, Del Curry, D. Brown, all those veteran guys. And I was a guy 18 years old and not knowing what I was getting myself into. So just watching these guys, how they carry themselves. I used to dress in sweats and a t-shirt and a baseball cap. Seeing these guys, how they prepare themselves, how they come to the arena with suits, um, how they can conduct themselves off the basketball court helped me tremendously as a teenager to prepare myself, you know, through my career. And, and we don't have that in our games these days because your veteran player is probably 25, 26 years mm -hmm. old. You ever regret coming out in high, after out of high school? Absolutely not. Never regretted it? Absolutely not. There were some cold days in Toronto that first year, weren't there? Very cold days. Coming from Florida, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I recall, I recall seeing a piece that they did on you during that first year where it didn't look like you were having the time of your life. Well, Darrell Walker kind of, you know, ruined that a little bit my first year. It was another coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was another coach. Chris Boyd. I, I, I actually, you know, I wanted to choke. Um, he, was a, he was an old school coach, you yeah. know, uh, nasty, nasty attitude. Um, and, and we butted heads a lot. And he act, he's quoted saying that I was going to be out of the league in three years. So looking back on that, after he got fired and Butch Carter took over, like I used that as motivation to prove him wrong. Yeah. He was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, was. he was for a fact. Uh, uh, last, que last question before we go to break. <laughs> Would LeBron get the super status of the NBA if he came into the league in the 90s? Yes. LeBron James, uh, I've been in the NBA for over 30 years now. There's always been a player who you can compare somebody to. LeBron James is the first player that I've never seen another player that I can compare to. You know, there's always been six, eight guys who were super talented, who were terrific players, but they all weighed like 220, 30 pounds. I don't think we've ever had a guy, uh, you know, who, you know, Tracy, uh, Scottie Pippen, who are all guys, six, seven, six, eight, great defenders, great scorers, very athletic. But LeBron outweighed those guys by 30 pounds. And I, I, we talk about it all the time, like, ooh, man, who, this is a freak of nature. So he would say, yes. yes. So I agree. I, I think he, he, he transcends errors. Um, I, I, I think he's an athletic uh, Ross, Oscar Robertson. If you look at that 60s era, 70s era, whatever that but was. But three inches bigger. And three inches bigger. Mm -hmm. If Then he's, uh, if you look in the 80s era, he's an athletic Magic Johnson. Uh, so then, and then in this era, he's himself. But you add the athleticism that the other guys that had the comparable skill sets had. Can we go he, to the next question? Seriously. Yeah. It's LeBron James. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the top what five ten players yep. of all time so yeah, let's you know, the, the guy the guy is a, like you said a, he's a freak of nature and, and being a, a small forward you know understand what type of player he is uh like again like charles said he's a player at six eight 260 270 with unbelievable speed and athleticism you can't wait where have you ever he, seen he that? actually could have been he's, better in ir in the and i tell you something if he ever really learns how to play on the post and adapt that as part of his game. You think he's unstoppable now? He might have played better. He might have played better, like you just said uh, in our listen, era. In our era, with better players and guys. Better play players, differently. and I think you've been posting up more. Yeah. And also because the way we filed in the '90s, right. he'd have developed a jump shot even quicker. All right. Yeah. Unanimous yes to that. And 
Steve Kerr getting testy. And we'll be back with <laughs> a little bit more no on open court on NBA TV. <laughs> Aren't they come no, up with a question? Right after this. LeBron would have been horrible in the 80s. <laughs> he would have sucked he in the 70s. He would have been brutal in the 70s. He might not even made the team. It might have been like Darren Walker said, Tracy was on to go play for three years. Darren Walker would have cut him. We are back here on open court as our uh, as our forum for you, the fans, continues as you ask us questions. Here's the next one. Pre-game meal. This is something that everybody has to answer. What was the pre-game meal for Rick Fox? Uh, was there one that you had? I mean, did, was it consistent? Uh, not always consistent, but uh, it was either salmon or it was uh, soggy raisin bran. <laughs> wow. A soggy raisin bran for those times when you're feeling not quite uh, up to snuff? You no, know, it, uh, it just worked for me. <laughs> Carbo, yeah, was just, that's how I got my carbs. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, some folks eat raisin, raisin bran for another yeah. reason. Uh, but um, <laughs> like T-Mac, who's nodding. Um, Pre-game meal. Believe it or not. Um, raisin bran. No, no. <laughs> after shoot-around, I eat, and then I don't eat again until after the game. Yeah, okay. What would you eat after shoot-around? Um, I have breakfast. I, uh, just right. Right. I'm gonna have to, what am I going to have to do to get a straight answer out of you on this? So what would you eat? <laughs> I mean, pancakes. Okay. One day, a, French toast. Okay. I, I just heavy. I, I was 220. I know. I eat the, anything the, I want. The guys who, the guys who the, tweet these want, watch they want details. They don't want breakfast. Okay, good. What do you have at dinner time? Dinner. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> okay, Ernie. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Ernie, you I, I, on paper, I thought this was a good question, and now it's... <laughs> yeah, I think No, I'm not going next. No, I'm not going next. What you have for a pregame meal? I'm like Team Mac. I ate right after shoot around, and then I didn't eat any more until after the game. But I ate chicken, fish, vegetable. I love spinach. I ate a lot of spinach. How about rice. cream spinach? Or no, just plain. <laughs> sauteed, 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 sauteed spinach. Sometimes I just had it boiled. I didn't like it. You know, I eat salty. Papaya. But uh, I, I, I'm a guy who likes a lot of vegetables. <laughs> so you like great. a lot of vegetables. I like a lot of vegetables. <laughs> You never know how many kids I, are going to start eating spinach now because, hey, Nick ate spinach. I'm going to fry catfish either. Yeah, I, uh, I used to. Uh, You're making this up. No, Go ahead, no, it's not. <laughs> 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 I was going to go outrageous. I know. But uh, probably like uh, grilled chicken and, and uh, any kind of pasta. That would be like a consistency that I would always have. But the craziest I've ever seen was Mark Jackson. What would he do? Uh, he'd have a hamburger, a cheeseburger rather, french fries, uh, a milkshake and a Diet Coke. A <laughs> Diet Coke after the milkshake? That was his, that was it. And I, I said, you eat this all the time? He's like, yeah, I'm a guard. I can run it off. <laughs> like, I just said, like, because you're not going to have energy. Well, Antoine Carter played to have a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken and a keg of beer. No kidding. <laughs> 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 Smitty. Uh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> beginning, I was eating a fish fillet meal from McDonald's. It's wow. Kevin Willis. You know, that's my guy from Detroit said, you know, you got to change your diet. And I started eating pasta and chicken, but a fish fillet, I would stop and get a fish fillet. Oh, meal. man. That was my meal. You never cramped up? Nah. That's funny. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> I can imagine what you had. I'm going to wait, though. I got to tell you what's funny about that. <laughs> It's Steve's turn up, but I'll tell you about it. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. You're, you're on a roll. I ate two fish fillets and a large fry and a Diet Coke. Oh. That was my pregame meal. For how long? Uh, every game? Uh, every game. Come on. For, yep. My, like my first, you know, until, you know, you start getting older and have to eat better. But my first. <laughs> then you ate four. Uh, my first. Uh, huh? Then you ate four. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, you have to start eating better when you get older. But I think when, I was, too. when I was in <laughs> yeah. Philadelphia, I did. I ate two fish fillets, a large fry, yeah. and I always washed it down with a Diet Coke. <laughs> I want to watch my girlish figure. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well done. I, just, you know, I know sushi. Whatever. Yes, yeah, sushi. sushi. No, I, I was like Kenny. I just, you know, pasta, chicken, whatever. But I'll tell you a quick story about Tony Kukoc that when he came over to the NBA, first game we, of the season, I asked him if he wanted to go grab a bite to eat. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon, kind of, you know, four hours before the game, and he orders this feast. I mean, salad, appetizer, huge plate of pasta, chicken glass of red wine, a dessert like tiramisu, and then he follows it up with an espresso. And I'm, I'm just in awe. I'm sitting there looking at him like, Tony, this is, this is your pregame meal? He goes, in Europe, we eat a lot. We drink a little wine. We have espresso. We go ho back to hotel, take beer, then we go play. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> hey, all right, here we go. <laughs> oh, Man, was what? I allowed to say that? I gotta honestly say, I did not see that story that going there. That's, that's awesome. I don't know why. I thought he was gonna say, "Oh, we have a game tonight." I oh, thought he didn't know no, the I, schedule I, was something. But you know, Ernie, you talk about that. We don't like the NBA teams normally depending on they practice at ten or eleven. So most guys, like these guys, you can hear, they say, we never eat breakfast because you don't want to get up. You're ready to sleep to the last minute, then go practice. You eat lunch. Then I never ate again yeah. after the game. You didn't I, eat a snack in between? No, I did oh. not. Oh, I, well, oh. I, as soon as I got oh. to the arena, oh. I had a peanut butter sandwich and a, a banana or a fruit or something every time. Oh, I just, like, I had to. See, I, and you guys were scoffing I would, I would at this question. Great and now question. It's, it's come out with this question. Hey, what stuff? about coffee? Are you, are I would have sugar. Uh, I would have, like... Yeah. A lot of Shakes. guys uh, have no coffee. coffee. You played with Doral Armstrong. Oh, my God. How much God. coffee would he have? I played with him as well. About five cups five before the game started. But my thing is, I don't know how guys eat an hour, two hours before a game. I, I don't know. How I don't understand how they do it. Bloated. Tony Kukoc had a solution. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big, big one. Big one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, next question. Uh, what was the most important shot in your career? The most important shot in your career. What was the most important shot? In your you know, my, all my shots was important. <laughs> <laughs> I love Every that. one I took was important. <laughs> I think the one that most people remember about me was we were playing the Spurs in game six. It was the last game at the Hemisphere Arena. Uh, and it was a tie game with, I want to say, 15 to 20 seconds to go. And uh, I get David Robinson, I got the ball at the top of the key. Coach just let it go at the end, overtime. Or uh, we, well, we win the game. We win. And I went one on one, and uh, I took two hard dribbles. David kept backing up, backing up, and I got right to the free throw line and hit it like a little 12 foot jumper. It's his game to win. Will we go to overtime? Barkley, 20 footer, yes, with 1.8 seconds. And that was the last game I ever played in that building. We won, and that cl clinched that series for us. So that's probably the most shot, the shot that most people remember about me. Do I do I uh, know? I mean, what I would assume in 1997, Steve, yeah. would be, yeah. would I mean, be your shot. Michael, easy, be ready. Pretty easy to pick yeah. for me on that one. 24. Here's Jordan. Did not have the shot. <laughs> Smitty. They hit a shot to uh, seal the game, the playoffs against the Pistons. No, I can't remember what year. I'm trying to think. We beat the Pistons twice, but that was that was. <laughs> You're with Atlanta. That was with Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. Smith, long shot out of the corner! Jet? Uh, the most one. memorable shot was probably against the uh, Orlando Magic game one. To tie, right you, you tied, tied, tied the Senate over time, right? broke, broke the NBA record for threes in that game. But my most memorable shot was my first college shot. Really? Yeah. That, that, my, my first college game was the most memorable game I've ever played in. Because, you know, in high school you play in front of 300, 400 people. And, you know, I mean, I mean a thousand, let's say, yeah. in, in your high school. And, and, and so when you walk out, and even when you practice in college, it's 20,000, but it's empty seats. So it was the first time you come out and there's 20,000 people, the band is playing, the cheerleaders are doing flips, and you come out of that tunnel and you look at your jersey, you go, man, I actually made it. Like, I made it to where I've been looking at on television. So for me, I knew then the lights were really on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, and that's different lighting in an arena than it is in your, in your high school. Yeah. So you see all of that for the first time, that to me, was my most well, well, tell me about that first shot that you hit as a and, Tar Heel. Well, my first shot was a, uh, a steal and layup. You know, it was a two-on-one layup and laid it in. So Did you it, steal it from? Uh, I stole it from, you no, know, it wasn't, I, I was going to, Gerald was the second game. Uh, that was my uh, my first shot in my second game ever. I stole the ball from Gerald Wilkins. Uh, we played at Tennessee UTC. State. Tennessee State. And, uh, well, Tennessee Chattanooga. Ch Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Tennessee, yeah. Tennessee Chattanooga. So I, I remember that. And, um, but, uh, it was against, um, I can't remember who the player was, but I do remember the steal and the layup. Correct hand in the passing lane, go down. <laughs> Good job, Kenny. So, so, <laughs> exactly, you know that. Oh, Good steal. Uh, you've, Actually, for me, it was probably after the trade from Atlanta to 
the Clippers. Clippers. And we came back to Atlanta, and I remember I was having a tough game in at the first half. I was so jacked up to play and show them that, you know, y'all made a mistake and traded me. I had four points at halftime. But I remember getting on a roll, and the last shot to put us ahead, it was a play on uh, John Conkat, Kevin Willis, and I think it was Danny Manning in the lane. And that particular shot, the arena erupted. Rook is on the offensive glass. Oh, my! The Clippers are going to take it. Dominique has come back and conquered his old team. For me, that was the most important shot because I had just got traded a I, couple weeks know what? before. You know how crazy it is? I remember because you gave the machine gun afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> machine gun, yeah. I think I ended up with 38 that night. You know, <laughs> let them know, like, uh, you know, I'm back. <laughs> T-Mac. That was good. <laughs> Did you hear that? He said, you said you finished up with 38. He said, minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I never had 4.38 minutes. That's what she was. Uh, <laughs> that was a good one. You remember one in particular, T-Mac? Um, I remember four, but they were all in one game. Go ahead. Oh. Um, yeah. oh Spurs. When yeah, yeah. We, we, were, the Spurs we were playing San Antonio. I think it was back in 04, my first year in, in Houston. And... Um, were you doing this game? Yes. Mar yeah, Marv Albert yes. was doing the game, too. Yeah. The game was over. Late, yeah, the game was, was over. over. Everybody's leaving. And, you know, I come down. I hit a three. And we foul to go to the free throw line. And um, I, I get a four-point play on Tim Duncan. I pump fake. And he fouls me. And I shoot. I make the three. Oh. And we're struggling to get the ball in on my third three. And whoever was taking the ball out just threw it up. And I, I jumped up over Tony Parker, grabbed the ball, and trying to get a shot off Bruce Bowen is all over me. He's following me from the time I touched the ball. <laughs> and I don't know how I got the shot up, but I was driving to the right and just pulled up on him and shot the ball, and it went in. McGrady over Bowen for three. Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> Tracy McGrady! We were down, I think, um, two at the time. San Antonio calls a timeout after that three. Uh, Devin Brown, they inbound the, inbound the ball to Devin Brown. Now, this was this one I knew it was meant for us to win this game <laughs> because he got the ball. Nobody touched him. I guess he thought he was, we were going to foul him. Nobody touched him, and he slips and falls, and the ball rolls to me. So I get the ball, and I'm driving. I'm looking for my spot on the court. Bent Berry is in front of me, and I just pull up. for the. I was going for the win the whole time. That's what I had in mind. Here comes McGrady. No timeout commanded. McGrady for the win. Yeah. Like 13 points in like 35 seconds. It was just it, it that, was that was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. But the best part was Sager's interview with Popovich after the game. <laughs> that was unbelievable. You know, 20 minutes later after the game, because Spurs were up, I think 12 with like yes. maybe 11 with about 35 38 seconds. seconds. Yes. Yeah, it was ridiculous what happened. But you can only imagine the Sager Pop <laughs> interview. We got to pull that up. Hard to believe what Tracy did with the 13 points in the last minute. What happened? How was he so hot? Did you sense he was feeling it? How was he so hot? Yeah, how the hell do I know? I, mean, I don't know. Guys get hot. I don't know why they get hot. They get hot. I have no idea. I mean, he's a great player. He's a great player. Were you surprised at some of the mistakes down there? Okay, Rick. I took uh, an immunization shot back as a kid. <laughs> that, that really changed <laughs> you had, had your brave face on. <laughs> yeah. no, uh, I, had a, I had a shot in uh, the NCAA Sweet 16, uh, North Carolina, oh, yeah. against Oklahoma. They were ranked number one yeah. uh, in the country. And we, we, for some reason, had an off year at Carolina. And I was able to hit a shot to knock them off. And I'd say one other time, I looked Kobe off in the NBA Finals. <laughs> Our first championship with about a minute to go. We were, we were in the corner, and he was, give me the ball, give me the ball. And I just <laughs> pump faked it to him and said, I got this one, Kobe. Hit a three and called a timeout, and we kind of went on from there. Oh. He still was mad at the... He was mad. I was open. <laughs> and they haven't spoken since. <laughs> uh, and we'll be back to wrap things up uh, in just a moment on Open Court. More open court episodes available at the click of a mouse on NBA.com.
Welcome back to Open Court, where uh, it's a fan takeover on Twitter, and uh, we've been fielding your questions and, and uh, getting a variety of really good responses from time to time. Um, which would you rather have on your team, a hybrid big man like Dirk or a traditional big man like Duncan? Tim Duncan. Uh, Tim, Tim, Tim well, Duncan. you had to oh, say okay. that you compared the two players, Dan. That's diff I think that's. I'm just, re I'm just relaying. The Tim question. Duncan's the greatest power forward ever yeah. played. Yeah. Just relaying the question. No, so that's hard. That's, it's two two different players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but the one of the reasons you would take Tim Duncan is he gonna get you more layups and easy basket. Dirk's uh, obviously, if you need a jumper, Dirk is your guy. I mean, Dirk is a great player. He, you know, you know, you talk about LeBron James. I don't think we've seen too many seven-foot jump shooters who are going to shoot threes out on the floor like Dirk. I mean, he's a unique guy. I mean, that's the reason I tried to give him all that money to go to Auburn the first time I saw him play. <laughs> you know? Yes, I know. Not to take anything away from Derek Nowinski. I like Charles. I, I mean, I love Derek Nowinski. He's one of the best jump-shooting big men I've ever seen. But Tim Duncan can beat you in a lot of different ways. Like I say, he plays that old traditional game where he's a fundamentally sound. And you look at that San Antonio team, the most fundamentally sound team in the league still. So he personifies that. Here's a guy who plays the game from the inside, who can score inside. He got the bank shot. He got to move. He can put it on the floor. And he's a really good defender as well as passer. Any, anybody Duncan. else want to? Duncan. 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 All right. If you could only visit one NBA city, which one would it be? Ooh. Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Can I visit my home city of L.A.? Yeah. If you could only go to one NBA city. Oh, New York. My. I, the reason why I, like, why I like New York and even being a New Yorker, but playing in the garden, you, you could get cheered by the, the opposition gets cheered. Yeah. And if you're playing well, regardless of who you are, and the other thing is they come to see the game. The, the, the show is the game. And so every move, every movement, everything is, is cheered, jeered, or, uh, or revered. That was not nice. like Clyde Fraser. Yeah, are nice. we talking about the city? Or, like a true New York. Are, are we talking about the city, city or, or are we talking about well, it's, it, Everything that goes into that city, you say, boy, it's a great place, and I love the, and the fans are good, or the fans are knowledgeable, or the, uh, I like the arena, or I shoot well there, or they got a good restaurant. Yeah, I think New York. We used to circle, we used to circle Miami, though, on the calendar. When, when you, you play in the Midwest and it's freezing cold, you look at that calendar and you got two trips to Miami, you look, do you have the day off before? Are you get, do you get down, can you get down there and get in the ocean? Can you get a little, I mean, uh, that was just for the weather. Getting alone. a little sun for us was not big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big you say, built in tents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think saying. you can never go wrong with Boston. What? Yeah. yeah. I think when you, you want to get to Boston. No, it's, no I'm just saying sports there was something special about that old Boston Garden. Oh, playing. Playing. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. yeah, listen, it, first of all, listen, most NBA cities, you know, people talk about nightlife. You get great nightlife in most NBA cities. But when I played, growing up in Alabama, not having a pro team, you got the Celtics, Sickers, and the Lakers every week. When you played the Celtics in that old dead floor, Mm -hmm. And they had some rats in there bigger than cats. <laughs> <laughs> it was still exciting to be there. And then the same thing with L.A. Like, as a, as a movie fan, when you sit there and there's Stallone, you know, the, you know there's Schwarzenegger. Denzel. There's Denzel. Or, yeah. And you're like a 20-year-old kid. You're like, oh, man, that's Denzel Watson <laughs> over there. And you end up throwing the ball over there so you can go over there and get it. I mean, it, it was pretty exciting. I mean, every star, I can tell people, we're all fans of other people. When you played in L.A., to see all those stars and you could touch them. And then the fun is the coolest thing about playing in L.A., Jack Nicholson is sitting right beside the bench talking to you the whole time. I remember telling my friends the first time I played in L.A., Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson know who I am. <laughs> like, I caught, because he like, first of all, he is, he is a great fan. But when he said something to me and told me I was playing well, I, I, I called all my friends and said, man, Jack Nicholson know who I am. Mm. It was pretty cool. Anybody? Yeah, for me, I would say it would be between New York and L.A. But from a marketing standpoint, you're always going to be in the media. You're always going to be in the limelight. And always typically two great teams. And, you know, actually when I came out of college, the reason why I came out, one of the reasons why I came out early because Jerry West told me that I would be number one pick, <laughs> be going to L.A. 
Unfortunately, Mitch Kupchak got hurt, and they had to take a bigger forward. To, and James, one, once I knew James Worthy was going to go first, I knew I was going to go third. I knew I wasn't going to the Clippers. Uh, and so, for me... At least not yet. Yeah, at that time. Yeah. 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 It's another whole story. Yeah. But it was a... It would have been a great experience to play in cities like that with such huge media and great, great players. Last question. What's all Next. this we hear about underdog? What's the deal? What does he do? What does he look like? Who is the man? Underdog, come on come out. On, underdog underdog, underdog come on has out. been <laughs> first. And they mic'd him up moments ago. <laughs> underdog, have a seat in between uh, T Mac <laughs> and, and Dominique Wilkins. He don't, hey, he don't, he's, he's the man. Don't, hey, guys, this don't move. He don't need all that pillow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. Underdog is our chief stat man on the NBA, has been for years. And, and, your, and your real name, Underdog, is not Underdog. No, Joe Underhill. A pr and a proud graduate you, you, you of know, Florida Gators. <laughs> oh my God! Go Tennessee! <laughs> wait, wait, time you out. Know, you know, Ernie, I like the way you shaved your beard up today. Is that yeah. because of today? Because this is your. your, your I, I was preparing for two weeks. <laughs> okay. <I'm sorry. laughs> hey, Ernie, it looks like you got a old facial too going on. Under <laughs> hey, Ernie, you look at skin looking his all hair? good. His hey, hair hair looking his hair hair well, uh, underdog has the best hair in the TNT family, but that's compared to TK, no Fiorello, and Ernie. So no you got the best hair. hair. You know, Ernie. Uh, you know, you look at uh, underdog. You look at Hal Galima. Our entire staff. You know, me, you, and Kenny and Shaq got the easiest job. Like we asked Underdog, we asked, we asked Underdog and Hal and those guys, but mainly Underdog's questions. Hey man, how many points this guy's average? Blah blah blah. Over the last ten years, over the, in the, over, yeah. in the three minutes yeah. of the game. Yeah. Blah, yeah. Blah, on like, a Tuesday. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. And he and like he, it makes us look like we know what we're talking about on television. <laughs> I mean, it's it's so awesome to have him and the crew just being greeted at what they do. Underdog, we appreciate what you yes. do on a nightly Good basis job. on uh, NBA TV and on, uh, and on TNT. And uh, thank you for making the cameo appearance. Underdog! Underdog. Oh, ready. And, that's nice. And with Good. that, uh, we wrap up the underdog edition of <laughs> Open Court here on NBA he's TV. He's still single, ladies. Yes, he's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he is.